Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can uh, hear me tonight. Um, my name is Sarah Williams. Um, I'm the Governance and Compliance Manager at Belfast City Council, and I'm responsible for the Council's language strategy, which uh, promotes and supports uh, our two Indigenous languages, um, Irish and Ulster Scots, as well as promoting awareness of our minority or newcomer languages, sign languages, uh, and also disabled communications. Um, on behalf of Belfast City Council, I'd like to give a warm welcome to everyone um, taking part this evening remotely, but actually located um, in, in Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, uh, and I'm sure beyond um, our speakers, uh, our panellists uh, and the audience. Um, I'd like to thank uh, in advance our main speaker uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Elva Johnson, um, and also our panellists on this side of the IRC, Linda Irvine and Leanne Briggs, and on the Scottish side, uh, Angus McKinnock and Meg Bateman. Um, it's a real privilege for the Council to be able to support uh, this evening's event as part of the commemoration of Column Kill 1500 and taking us back to the time when the seas were the information superhighways and the monasteries of East Ulster and, and Iona were at the forefront of learning and communications between different people and reminding us how people from different backgrounds and different places are linked through shared language and heritage. Um, I'd like to thank, especially thank uh, Forest Nagelica for all the support and help they have given us uh, to organise this evening and for Regina Holhing, who is the chair of First Nagelica, for chairing uh, this evening's panel session. Finally, I'd like to thank our own um, Irish language officer, Colin McGuigan, um, who helped to organise this evening and is also working with me on taking forward the Council's language strategy on how we can support and promote uh, the Irish language in the city of Belfast. Due to my children's bedtimes this evening, I unfortunately won't be able to stay until the end, um, but I really look forward to being able to stay as long as I can um, to be able to hear um, Dr. Johnson's lecture this evening um, and some of the panel discussion. So thank you very much and Regina. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much for that and uh, for opening a very interesting evening for all of us as we celebrate uh, Columkilla uh, 1500. And uh, of course, we are delighted to be part of this celebration and on behalf of Forest and the Gaelic as well. Uh, in my role as chair, I know that we are delighted to be participating in this session this evening and in this seminar. I will just give a very few little uh, housekeeping notes to begin with so that we can get started on the main business of the evening and look forward to a wonderful and inspiring talk from Dr. Elva Johnson and also a discussion from our very esteemed panel members. So on the housekeeping, the webinar is being recorded. Attendees will not have access to their cameras and microphones throughout. Uh, all questions for our speaker and panelists should be placed in the Q&A box on your menu, not the chat, the Q&A. And should you need technical support, please email uh, webinar at plan, and I'm sorry, I can just about, at, at uh, planned.co.uk. So that's webinar at planned.co.uk. And uh, the chat function will be available throughout, but for questions at the end, uh, we will be using the Q&A, as I have already said. So to move uh, maybe straight into the uh, business of the evening, and um, I, I'm delighted uh, to welcome not only um, an excellent scholar, but also a colleague of my own in University College Dublin, uh, Dr. Elva Johnson, to give the keynote lecture this evening. As well as that, we will look forward to a very interesting panel uh, with uh, Linda Irvine, Leanne Briggs, Meg Bateman and Ingus McKinnoch. And I can assure you that uh, on the side of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Ireland, we are going to have a wonderfully um, vibrant talk on not only column kill in the context of historical roots and how important he is to our shared histories, but also in a current context and how we have brought a little bit of that heritage to bear on who we are today. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing this with our esteemed panelists. So I will start with um, the with uh, Elva. O Runga Haragail, 
Naiv Khachana Svanish from down to Argyle, shared saints in the early uh, Middle Ages. Olaf uh, Kolach, Elva Johnson, a school in the star, a college in the whole school of Alyakia, the special Yehaki in the U Ernaha, the Manisha, Agasanask, a Jerkultish in the U Agas Palichiat, the Manisha. So just to introduce Elva, uh, she is a, an associate professor in the School of History in University College Dublin, and she has a particular interest in Irish saints of the Middle Ages and in the links. Uh, between all these and uh, the politics of the Middle Ages. So um, I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Elva. And as we talk tonight, I suppose, just to remember, I suppose, what also what Sarah uh, mentioned there about our shared histories and our journeys. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, that we're, we're starting with Elva way back in the Middle Ages and going to, you know, Colum Killa Viona, Maluig of the Hebridean uh, Isle of Lismore and Fianian of Moville. But also when we move into our discussion on the panel, we move into the Taurus project, which Linda Irvine uh, is heading up in uh, East Belfast as well. So we can see how we've really come from the Middle Ages right into the present day. So let's start now with the Middle Ages. Goran Wahigat Elva. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Regina Gervmagus. Um, while I'm my weakest goal is Nadina, a dagrig on a hard saw, a rock where a hort on can lard live in us. August while I'm trace you low or up panel come off shot a curly kela. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for the chance to talk to you this evening and for putting together such a fantastic panel. A not beg me a fairkant there and Luke Yangle. Of Jan Fado, either in the Neev of our in your quick Ola, Agus Iadavar in your Nahalban. Um, Nas new Kyangal Abae, a Hugdina Shirak Sinir, uh, Naska Kur Gumurla Sailanina, or Gahe of the Quirinaheran. This evening I will be exploring the close connection between the saints of East Ulster and Western Scotland. This connection went both ways in rich, in rich communities and the lives of people on both sides of the Irish Sea is on own or dumb, very kind of an opt -in. It's a great honour for me to be talking to you this evening, um, even if I'm doing it on Zoom. So I'm just going to, now that I've got the formalities out of the way, I'm going to share my screen with you and I will start the talk. Uh, when I was um, approached to to uh, to talk to you, I, I was I was really excited um, because this is an area that I'm very interested in myself in terms of my research. Um, I knew I wanted to talk about Argyle and about Western Scotland um, because for quite a while I've been sort of looking at what knowledge there was of Scottish saints in Ireland, and I knew I wanted to talk about County Down as well. I wasn't sure what part of County Down I'd end up talking about. Research ends up having its own momentum, and I'll be saying, you know, quite a lot about uh, Bangor uh, this evening. But, but what I want to do first is establish, I suppose, a series of contexts, which I hope will, you know, put my my remarks, as I said, in a greater context. Uh, and the first one for me, and it's it's really the most important, is connectivity and shared connections. And I just took this image um, from Google Earth. And when you look at an image like that and there is no, you know, there's no settlements there, there's no boundaries, you can see how close Ulster and the west of Scotland are. And in the early Middle Ages, the period that I look at, uh, this closeness, this connectivity is expressed in a number of different and intersecting ways. Um, one, and it's it's really important, and you mentioned it a little bit at, in the introduction, um, is shared languages. And throughout history, there have been shared languages on both sides of the Irish Sea, um, in Scotland and in Ulster. Now, in the period I'm looking at, uh, the main shared language we're talking about is Gaelic. So Gaelic, there's Gaelic speaking communities in both Western Scotland and in Ulster, and that shared language um, leads to other types of sharing as well. So there's a shared politics, what Regina referred to a little bit earlier. So the sort of the politics that is happening in East Ulster has an impact on what's happening in Western Scotland and vice versa. And I'll delve into that in a little bit more detail, not too much detail, a little bit more detail um, later. 
And along with the shared language, the shared politics, you also have shared saints. Now, why are these shared saints so important? And for somebody who studies the early Middle Ages, one of the most important ways that you can gain an insight into that period is by looking at saints. Now, there's a few reasons for this. Um, first of all, saints were believed by their communities to be individuals of great power. Uh, in a way that's maybe more difficult for us to understand today, they were very much seen as being the connection between life on earth and the afterlife, and they had sort of a power and mystique about them. Um, there were individuals with local connections, but really crucially, these local connections could also become international connections as well. So saints could join communities um, with each other, and they could also um, join communities both nationally and internationally. And saints were also used as expressions of identity and aspiration. And a good example of that is, and I have it on the slide here, um, is, is Columba. And obviously this series of webinars is to celebrate the 1500th anniversary of his birth. Um, this is a really famous manuscript. It's held in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. It's known as the Cahoc. Um, and it was believed that it was a relic of Columba and that it was a powerful relic um, and that by having this relic, it gave the individual who held the relic um, a type of power. Now, there's been a lot of debate about whether Columba is indeed or Columcilla is the scribe of the manuscript. I suppose the most we can say is he could have been. I mean, the date, the dates are right. So that's an example of how powerful saints were seen to be. They were powerful in their own lifetime but they're also powerful after their deaths. And so this is something we have to bear in mind when we look at the cult of the saints uh, during this period. Now, another context I want to introduce you to as well is a political context. Now, I don't want to make this uh, too complex and too detailed for you, um, just enough to get a sense of how things connect together. Um, this map I've taken from a book um, by Thomas Charles Edwards uh, called Early Christian Ireland. Um, it's, a, it's a great introduction to the period. And it's a map of, the, of Ulster in and around 700. And I want you just to notice a few things. Um, I don't have a pointer with me because I'm doing this on Zoom. But if you look up in the sort of the northeast corner, you've got Dal Riada um, in, in what's now Antrim. Um, and there's a kingdom of Dal Riada in Ireland, and then there's a larger kingdom of Dal Riada in the west of Scotland, which go, goes on to be foundational in the development of the kingdom of Scotland. Now, the people of Dal Riada in Ireland and in Scotland had shared genealogies and they had a shared sense of identity. Um, there's other groups of people here as well. They're very important. If you look down to the east of, of Loch Ney, going into, into Belfast Loch, you can see various groups known as the Ullid, um, or, or the Ulstermen, and they too had connections and interests in Western Scotland. And I'm going to be looking at quite a lot of those connections this evening. Um, these connections, they play out in terms of politics, kinship, ecclesiastical connections, um, and they also take place against the backdrop of changing political power. Sometimes when we look at the past, and especially a past as distant as this, we sort of sometimes think it's maybe timeless and unchanging, um, but just like now, um, various groups rose and uh, fell in power. Um, the politics was sort of ongoing and it kept changing. During this period, one of the biggest changes that's occurring is a group of peoples known as the Enail um, are becoming more and more powerful. And they're particularly powerful in Mid-Ulster um, and Tyrone, uh, Tyrone um, the, the modern name, uh, bears the name of one of these groups of people, the, the Kenail known of, of the Enail. So what you have is a complex political situation where you have different groups with different interests. From our point of view, the most important are the Dalriada and the Olid, both of whom have very close connections with Scotland. I just want to say a very brief note about the sources that I'm using and, and just give you a sense of what they can tell us and what their limitations are as well. So there's, there's three main types of sources. Um, there is lives of saints. So saints' lives, it's, it's a sort of a form of, uh, of genre. Um, it's a biography of a saint which tells you know, how special the saint is before birth, the miracles of the saint, um, the death of the saint, and sometimes the miracles after the death of the saint. Uh, one of the most important saints' lives 
for looking at those connections between Ulster and Scotland as the life of Columba, which is written in the seventh century of the life of Columkilla. And I will be referring to that life at various points over the course of the talk. Um, another text, and you have an image of it there on, on your screen, um, are, are texts known as martyrologies. I, I know it's probably the, not the most exciting sounding word of all time. Uh, martyrologies are basically lists of saints, um, and it gives each saint on the day they're commemorated. So they're commemorated in the mass or in the liturgy mainly, um, but it will also say where they're located and might tell you their genealogy. And it's actually quite an important source for looking at how saints cults change over time, because it's a bit like what I said about the politics. The cult of a saint isn't static. A saint may be venerated um, hugely in the decades after his or her lifetime. Um, that veneration may dip. They may become less important over time, or they may become more important. So we'll be looking at two saints that have that sort of contrasting career today. Uh, Columba, um, whose importance, if anything, grows over time. He becomes more and more prominent as a saint. And another saint I'll be looking at, a saint associated with Bangor, Kovgal, is a saint who's really important in the decades after his lifetime, um, but becomes maybe less important as the centuries pass. During their lifetimes, they were probably of around equal importance. Uh, and the final source that um, I've drawn on is, is place names. Place names will often incorporate the name of a saint. Um, you can think of place names, um, you know, such as of Kilbride place names, quite common ones where you've got, you know, the kill and then the name of a saint. So they're, they're a way for us maybe to trace the development of the cult of saints as well. Um, all of the sources I'm looking at do have limitations. There's not a huge number of them. Um, they're mainly sources from before the 12th century. And obviously there's a big gap between the 12th century and the present. Um, but I'll try and give you as much of a sense of how this material works together um, as I go through the paper. But I always think it's important to be upfront about where you're getting your information from. Okay, I'm a big believer in maps, in showing, in showing distribution. They can be a bit misleading at times, but um, what this is a map of is the saints and, and the sites in Western, well, in Scotland. I mean, as you can see, it's, they're not all in Western Scotland. They extend across the centre and into the east of Scotland um, that are mentioned in these Irish sources before the 12th century. Now, as you can see, um, and these would be direct references in those texts are referred to as martyrology, so saints who are being commemorated um, in the calendar. Um, as you can see, Iona is absolutely dominant. Um, in, in fact, it's, it's one of the most dominant overall. If you took all of the, the Irish and the Scottish dedications, Iona would be one of the top ones. And you can see there's, you know, 20 references. Um, then there's references to other sites such as Egg, Kingar, Lismore, Strathern, and so on. Now, what I'll be focusing on are those Western um, dedications. Um, so again, I, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the map and you can see on the sort of the Northwest, you know, up, in, you know opposite the, the, the Hebrides. Um, so I'll be looking at those sites extending from Apple, Apple Cross um, and down to um, Kingarth. Uh, which is um, on the Isle of Bute. So they're the main ones I'll be focusing. You can see Iona there uh, very centrally um, located. So that's to give you a sense of what I'm looking at. Um, and if I extended that map onwards, um, you would see how close those coastal sites are to the coast of Ulster. Um, and, and that's one thing we need to think about. I was really delighted to hear, you know, those comments about the sea being sort of a super highway uh, during this period, because it's really true. Um, when we look at those coastal sites, we shouldn't think of them as isolated and away from the world. They're really important points of connection across the sea. They're really vibrant centers. Um, when we visit some of these sites now, and, you know, they, you, know you often get that sense of, you know, the, the, the ruined church and the beautiful for landscape, we maybe lose sight of the fact that they were also these, you know, very vibrant centres uh, during this period. So they weren't in any way um, sites that were away from the world, they were very much part of the world. So I think that's sort of an important thing to, to realise. So what am I going to focus on? Um, obviously, when your, your time is limited, when I started working through the material on this, this paper, the problem 
that I got was it was what to leave out, actually. Um, you know, sometimes it's a really nice problem to have. But on the other hand, then it's um, it's quite hard to make a decision of, you know, what, you know, what will I include um, and what will I maybe not focus on as much? So what I decided to do um, and as I go through the paper, I hope it'll make sense, is I wanted to focus particularly on the East Ulster connections that with Saints in Scotland. I also wanted to look at where I think there is further possible connections um, with, you know, Kim Garth and Liz Moore. Um, what I'm not going to do is focus as much on Iona, though Iona provides the overarching framework um, to understand what is happening. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to look at Iona in a bit more detail. The reason I don't want to start off looking at Iona or focusing on Iona at the moment is because Iona is so prominent and its connections are so important that everything else um, becomes very overshadowed. And the result is that other connections, which are also quite important and are significant and they tell us quite a lot, uh, they, they actually get forgotten because we're, we're so drawn to Iona. And I mean, there's loads of reasons for that. Iona is one of the most important um, churches in Ireland and Britain, um, you know, in, in that whole world in the in the Middle Ages. It's got a huge significance. Some of the most beautiful manuscripts um, that survive were produced in Iona. If you think of maybe the Book of Kells, Book of Durrow, more than likely as well. So um, it's hard to look away from Iona, but that's what I want to do. But because this is a webinar in honor of Colum Killa, I will come back to him at the end. Okay, so this is what I've decided to really put my focus on. Um, so when I looked at, at East Ulster and the geography of East Ulster, you know, two churches in particular um, stood out for me. And these are the churches of, of Mogvilla, Moville, and Benchor or, or Bangor. Um, and, 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 and both churches are highly significant into the seventh and the eighth centuries. In both cases, they lose a little bit of significance. And this is probably one of the reasons that their contribution to these connections that I'm going to highlight today maybe ends up getting so overshadowed. So I'd say a little bit about both. Um, Moville um, is, 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 is a very important early church. Um, there's at least a dozen saints in those martyrologies associated with Moville. In fact, of all the counties in Ireland, there are more saints associated with County Down than any other by a lot. There's over 70 saints. So if you were going to say the Isle of Saints, you'd actually say the County of Saints. And that is, without a doubt, that's County Down. The next closest is West Mead, um, which is way behind Down. So there's loads of saints. It's mainly these two churches is the reason for that. So um, Moville has a really interesting history. It's founded by a British saint, a man named Finian. Um, Finian is also associated, um, his education is associated with Scotland to a certain extent as well. Um, and we could maybe see in Moville and in the cult of Finian, um, maybe an, an early example of that connection uh, between, you know, East Ulster and, 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 and Western Britain. Um, Finian is such a popular and important saint that he ends up being localized in different parts of Ireland. So there's a Finian in Clonard as well, but he's actually almost certainly the same as, as this Finian. So the, and, and any of the sources we look at would suggest that the, the connection with Down, with Moville, is probably the original connection. Um, and actually, lots of other evidence we have, if I would loads more time, I would talk a bit more about this, is that, you know, Down is very much a centre of, of early Christianity in Ireland. I mean, obviously there's Down Patrick, associated with Patrick, and then but Moville and Bangor. Now, Bangor, when I, again, when I started my, my work on this, I wasn't sure whether it would be Moville or Bangor that I would end up concentrating on more, but it actually ended up being Bangor. So Bangor, it's a, a church, it's founded by Kovgol, who I've already mentioned, um, he's a contemporary of, of Colum Killa, and in the biography of Colum Killa, um, they're described as, as meeting on a number of occasions. On one occasion, they meet um, sort of on the road between Limavadi and Derry. In another occasion, um, uh, Kovgal goes and visits um, Columbia or Colum Killa um, in, in the Hebrides. Um, Bangor is the church which produced Columbanus, who's, I suppose, famous for bringing sort of the Irish form of Christianity um, to the continent. Um, it has 
lots of interest in Western Scotland, um, probably from around the same time as I own. And remember that Cuthbert and Colum Kidd are contemporaries, and that's quite important, I think, to the story that I'm going to tell. And it has loads of saints um, associated with it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have as much evidence of its manuscript culture as we have of Iona. There is this really important survival, the Antiphonary of Bangor, um, which is in the um, Ambrosiana in Milan. It's probably produced around 700 and is one of the most important documents we have for sort of reconstructing, um, you know, the, the early Irish church. Um, it, it's, it, it's basically a series of sort of hymns and poems. It's a really important text. Um, what I want to do now is, is sort of focus in on, on Bangor and, and its connections. And I'm going to do a sort of, I'm going to put a spotlight on a few different um, ecclesiastical sites. And then what I'm hoping to do is at the end, I'll bring all of this together uh, and see what we can do with it. So the first site I want to mention is, is, is Apple Cross. If you remember that map I had of, um, of Scotland, um, Apple Cross is, is right up in that northern part. Um, and in the period we're looking at, it's on the boundary really between the Gaelic speaking part of Scotland, Dalriada, and the Pictish um, speaking parts of Scotland. And, and during this period, the Pictish speaking parts of Scotland would have been actually quite a bit more extensive. And we can see this quality of Apple Cross and its name, Aber, Aber Crossan, um, which comes from a Pictish. It's a, the Aber part is definitely um, Pictish. Now, it was founded by a man named uh, Moel Rova, um, who dies in 722. Um, now, he's associated with, with Bangor. He's a monk of Bangor, and he found, founds Apple Cross um, from Bangor. Now, the cult of Moel, Moel Rova is quite extensive. He's He's not only sort of, there's not only veneration in Apple Cross itself, not a huge amount survives from Apple Cross. There's a few fragments and I've put them up on the slide. Um, but he's also, there's a number of commemorations to him on the Isle of Skye. And again, if you looked at your map of Scotland, you would see why, because Skye is very close to Apple Cross. Again, Skye um, is, is controlled by the Picts um, during this period. Um, a lot of the time, um, Colum Killa is described as being sort of the, the, the missionary of among the Picts. But actually, if we look at some of these Bangor churches, it's may, or Bangor connected, I should say, uh, churches, it's maybe more likely that we should look at these people. Um, now, um, Moel Ruffa himself, he's of the Northern Enail, that group I mentioned, and of the Canal known, who are based in Mid-Ulster. He's commemorated in a lot of Irish sources. Um, and one of the things which I find fascinating about looking at Moel Ruffa and looking at Apple Cross is the extent to which this may be, um, is something that goes back to the time of Kovgal himself. Now, as I mentioned, Kovgal is a contemporary of, of Colum Kila, not nearly as famous as him. And one of the things that I've always found frustrating, and actually much more frustrating as I was putting this together, um, is Kovgal is a type of figure who appears on the edges of really important contemporary texts. So in the life written by, by Columbanus, who I mentioned by his biographer in Italy, uh, Kovgal is mentioned as this great holy man. He appears in the life of Colum Killa, um, but the only life we have of him is much later. So he's sort of there on the edges of different narratives and it's sort of frustrating that we don't have more. Um, now, one of the reasons that I, I think that that connection goes back to Kovgal is that in the life of Columba, um, in, on many occasions, um, as I mentioned, you have Columba coming in contact with different saints, including Kovgal. And on that meeting, um, he has between sort of Limavari and, and Derry, they, they stop on the roadside at a well, they're drinking from the well, and uh, Columba says to, to Kovgal, um, you know, that well with the water that's so clear now, it'll become sort of polluted and destroyed uh, because there's going to be a battle here between your kindred and my kindred. And so Kovgal is of the Olid, that group that I mentioned earlier, um, Colum Killa is of the Inyale. And uh, 
it's one of those prophecies, um, which of, is of events that the author of the biography knew what the result was. And in fact, in that battle, the Ullid were defeated by the Enail. And I think what we're seeing there is maybe some of that ecclesiastical rivalry, which is also maybe playing out in Western Scotland as well. Um, so there's something really interesting going on with that particular cult. Um, actually, before I, I leave that slide, I'll just go back for a moment. Um, one thing I'd like to emphasize, and I, and I probably should have emphasized this a little bit earlier, is I'm looking at this from the point of view of the sources that we have from Ireland. There's obviously sources from within Scotland as well. Um, the life of Columba, in fact, is one of them. But there are many other sources um, which I'm not referring to this evening. Um, and sometimes if I had a criticism of some of my colleagues on this side of the Irish Sea, and I would include myself um, in this, is that sometimes we assume that the influence is automatically from Ireland to Scotland rather than from Scotland to Ireland. And of course, it's completely bi-directional. Um, it goes in both ways. It's very natural that it does so with that shared language, that shared culture um, and so on. And there was a really good example of this um, with Apple Cross in that one of the later abbots of Bangor is actually somebody who began their career at Apple Cross. So it's, it's not a case that it's, it's a one-sided relationship. Um, it's just that because of the sources I'm discussing this evening, they are coming more from that Irish side. But I do want to emphasize that it's a shared, a shared and a really an equal relationship between um, both sides. Now, I wanted to give a little snapshot of that shared relationship. Um, this is not a particularly um, prominent site. Um, Loch Brickland, it's uh, Loch Brickland. Um, there's still a there's still a cranog there, um, and there's a reference to it which took me a while to track down in in one of the sources I was looking at, and it refers to to three saints, Nasid, Bjorn, and Melon, and they're described as the three saints from Britain who are in one church in Iachachalad. Uh, now Iachachalad um, is that sort of olid kingdom that I pointed out to you um, a few slides back. And Yechuk Olad also contains the churches of Bangor and Moville. So we're looking at that same uh, geographical area. And what I like about this reference is it's three saints who have traveled from Western Britain and they've established their foundation in Ireland. Now, a lot of the time, it's very hard for us to know which direction the travel is taking place, because in some cases we have the name of the saint um, where they're located, but because the name is a Gaelic name, we don't know, is it you know, a saint, an Irish speaking saint from Western or Gaelic speaking saint from Western Scotland or a Gaelic speaking saint from Ulster. So I think the sense of maybe the, the level of the interconnection is something that's hidden a little bit in the sources and, and something like, this reference is a really valuable reminder of how those connections do go in both directions. And, you know, again, as I said, it's something that that gets a little bit lost maybe in the narratives that are written about the history of early medieval Ireland. In a way, it's sort of the history of early medieval Ireland and then forgetting about the fact that early medieval Ireland and Northern Britain are so closely connected throughout this entire period. And it's very hard to do the history of one without looking at the history of the other. Um, and, you know, it's something I sort of regret that this is something that I didn't maybe spend as much time on um, as I should have done years ago. But like, there's nothing like the zeal of the converted when it comes to this. Um, I now want to, to turn and look specifically at the saints of what I've broadly described as, 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 as the Isles. Um, and there's, there's a number of really prominent cults. Now, again, the most famous one is Columba or Columkila and, and Iona, the one which overshadows um, all of the others. Um, but several other cults are well known in, in Ireland and are, are clearly influential. So you have the cult of, of Donon, it's a martyr cult um, on the Isle of Egg. Um, though there, there's a sort of an, an oddness about this one because they, there's clearly loads of interest in Donon. You can see it in some of the sources that we have and stories about his martyrdom. But the place name Egg, they become very confused by. And, and, and by the 12th century, they, they're not sure 
whether egg is an island or, or whether it's a stream or what egg is. But it's, it's just an example of sometimes how geographical knowledge can be lost. Um, but the, the two cults I really want to look on a little bit more detail um, are the really famous cult, I suppose, of Malug, of, of Lismore, and then of Blaun or Blaine in Kingart. Um, in, in the case of, of Blaun, his cult site moved from Kingart to Dunblane, and it's probably Dunblane that you know, people associate him with um, to a great extent now. Now, when I went to look at these two cults, um, Bangor once again came to the forefront. I mean, and I would really like to stress that I wasn't expecting this to happen when I started looking at the material. And then as I worked through it, I was going, you know, actually there's a Bangor story here as well as an Iona story. So it, it, this is relatively new for me as, as, as well as in just in the last few weeks, actually. Um, so the I'll start off with the, um, the cult of Blaun or, or Blaine. The name Blaun is, is quite an unusual name. I mean, just sort of a debate around its origin. Um, his main site, um, Kian Garrod or Kingarth, it's located on the Isle of Bute, um, and it's in the Kingdom of Dol Riadh. Now, there's, a, there's an important political element to this that I want to just uh, touch on, and I'll be looking at that with Lismore as well. So it's located in um, the territory of one of the three main branches of the uh, Kingdom of Dol Riadh, and this is Kenel Kovgal. Um, the main branch, Kenel Nauron, are the branch associated with Iona. When we look at it, each branch sort of has a major church associated with it. And then the church, which is linked with the group that finally dominate the kingship of Dal Riada, is in fact Iona. And I think there's an argument to be made that um, apart maybe from um, Colum Killa's fame during his lifetime, that part of the success is actually down to the political success of the various dynasties. I know that can be a little bit reductionist at times, but I do think it's something that we should take um, into account. Um, now, Blaine is probably a contemporary of Colum Killa. As, as, as a figure, he's, he's actually quite a shadowy figure. Um, he's, he's well attested, or at least the sight of Kingarth, Blaine himself not so much, um, is, is well attested um, in Irish sources up to the end of the 8th century. So a number of different ecclesiastics associated with Kingarth appear not only in straightforwardly religious texts, but they also appear um, in the Irish annals. Now, an argument has been made very convincingly for many decades that our most important, um, I suppose, Irish chronicle, which becomes the Annals of Ulster, began its life in Iona. I think this is almost certainly true. And I think one of the reasons we're getting so much information about sites in Western Scotland is because of that Iona interest. And again, Iona is very interested in what's happening in Ulster as well. So from that period, we're getting a lot, lot, a lot of information. Um, now, Kay Muir, who as some of you will know her as, as a real expert on, on, on place names, has suggested that the name of Blaine uh, may appear in a townland in County Down. Uh, it could be Chalk, Chalk Blonde, the House of Blaine, for example, which would suggest maybe some sort of connection um, between his cult. There's an interest in his cult, without a doubt. Um, but does that interest um, extend to maybe dedications to Blaine appearing in, in and around County Down. It's an interesting, I mean, it's not something you can be absolutely certain about, but it, but it is an interesting, an interesting argument and it's an interesting um, extra dimension. Um, the, the connection with East Ulster is actually probably stronger in the next case I'm going to mention, and this is the cult of um, Maluog um, in, in Lismore. Um, and, you know, he's a very important saint. So he's again, his main church, Lismore, um, is located in one of the branches of the Dal Riada. This is Kenel Loarn. Um, and, and actually, just a sign of its importance is when I started off on a project where I was looking at cult dedications, um, Lismore, you know, kept turning up. And I made, I have to admit, the sort of possibly classic mistake where I assumed that references to Lismore um, in Irish language sources were references to Lismore in County Waterford, but there were not. There were references uh, to Lismore in the Western Isles. And in fact, the main Lismore is the one in the, the Western Isles. And when they refer to Lismore in Waterford, they refer to it as 
you know, less more Mechaza. They have less more of Mechaza, who's the, the main saint. So that's the distinction they make. The, the actual name, Liz Moore, and it just says Liz Moore in an early text. It's it's this Liz Moore they're talking about. Um, Malog is, is quite closely connected with the politics. He's, there's loads of dedications, I should add, to him, you know, across the Western Isles. Um, but he's also, you know, located within the politics of Ulster. Um, there's a group called the, the Dal Narada, who would be um, to the north of Loch Ney. Um, and they claim him as, as a member. Um, I mean, whether he is or not, I mean, uh, one point I suppose that a lot of um, historians or scholars in my area would, would say is that genealogies can be as much about sort of um, legend and politics as they are about actual biology. I mean, genealogies uh, change quite a lot over time. Um, people, if somebody's successful, people are very keen to include them within their family grouping. Um, you even see it in the case of, um, say, somebody like, like Patrick, who, who isn't Irish. Um, but when Patrick comes to Ireland, they have him bring a, a lot of sisters with him. And then one of them ends up in Valencia and she has 19 children and then various family uh, claim a connection that way. So it's something that we get in sort of Gaelic sources all of the time. But what's interesting about this connection with Maluog is that it's one that's very prevalent. So even as late as the 12th century, um, he's been described as originally having, having been a monk of Bangor. Now this occurs in um, the life of St. Malachy, whose feast day it actually is today. And um, in his life, his biographer Bernard, you know, mentions the fact that this great Saint Maluog um, had originally been a monk of Bangor. Now, it is possible um, that Malachy is using the connection um, for his own purposes. I think that argument could be made. Um, but once again, I think what we're seeing here is while maybe not every connection is very solid, what we're seeing is a pattern of connections in which it seems that Bangor has a lot of interests. In, in Western Scotland and in its turn is being influenced by developments there. And obviously the, the, the really nice solid one is the, um, the, the monk in Apple Cross who then becomes uh, the abbot of Bangor. Okay, I couldn't not talk about uh, Colum Killa obviously this evening. And I want to sort of come back again to a point I made, I made earlier is how the prominence of Iona overshadows everything else. And again, it wasn't really until I started putting together the um, elements of this paper that it became really clear to me to what extent this was true. So it's by far the greatest monastery uh, with Irish connections. Um, it's the main church of the most important dynasty in Dal Riva, the Canel Nauron who go on to be the ancestors of the kings of Alaba and, and Scotland. Um, Columba himself appears to have been a remarkable figure within his community memory. And one of the reasons that the biography we have of Columba, a life that's written a century later uh, by another uh, um, abbot of Ion Adivnon, one of the reasons it seems so immediate to us is it's partly based on the recollections that were collected from old men who knew Colin Killer when he was alive. So there's a community memory that runs through his biography. And it's one of the reasons that people go to Colum Killer and to that life of Colum Killer again and again, because it has that, it has that greater sense of a, you know, a religious community than any of the other early lives that we have. The other ones are, are much more full of sort of extremely miraculous and um, very sort of legendary events. The life of Columba has, has a much greater sort of verisimilitude about it. Um, now, Columba's communities flourished on both sides of the Irish Sea. They flourished in Northern Britain. Uh, they flourished in Ireland. Um, there was also a period in which Columban influenced communities uh, flourished in Northern England. So uh, the Monastery of Iona um, is looking at all times towards different audiences, audiences in Britain and in audiences in Ireland. Um, you know, one of the things, if you're if you're reading sort of histories of early Ireland, very often Iona is sort of unproblematically described as being, being an Irish monastery. Uh, we have to remember it's actually not located in Ireland. I mean, it's probably better to describe it as a Gaelic monastery. Um, and and I, I think that's 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 more accurate as well. But it's so important, it's so prominent, it's it's a church that produces so much. Um, 
that, as I said, everything else is overshadowed. And we can see that process really um, from the beginning of the seventh century. And I wanted um, to give you an example. And because I, well, I'm not in Belfast, but I'm virtually in Belfast. I did want to have sort of a Belfast connection. Um, so this is from that life of Columba that I mentioned. It's the, the life that's written by a century after his death um, by, by Adafnan. It may have been written actually as a sort of a commemoration. Um, the page there is actually the page from which I've taken this, this translation is by the Andersons, but it's from that particular page, it's from the left-hand column. And if you, if you, you'll actually be able to see the name of Belfast Lock if you, if you go down the column there carefully. So the, the manuscript um, was written under the direction of, of Adavnon by another abbot of Iona, future abbot, a man named Dorabena. And it's the one of the closest things we have to an autograph copy. It's an exceptionally valuable manuscript, which is now in uh, Schaffhausen um, in, um, in Switzerland. But if you go to this wonderful website here, the Codices website, you can actually explore the entire manuscript. It's just a beautiful example of calligraphy as well. It's such a valuable document. Um, but one of the things that I did is once I sort of began to see this banger, banger connection, I said, you know, I really better go back to Adafnan and see any references to Kovgal, any references to banger within the text. And I found this one which I just think is absolutely perfect. So it describes, as you can see, um, the monks of Kovgal who drown in Belfast Lock. And I think this might be one of the earliest references in literature to Belfast Lock. I see it's the original, it's the Irish name. It's the, the Lake of the Calf, Loch Liuk. And so they're drowning, they've a guest with them. And instead of their souls going directly up to heaven, um, because the guest isn't as holy as they are, demons have come and are trying to drag them down to hell. So this is, you know, Belfast Lock as a gateway to heaven and hell, which I have to say I do quite like as, a, as, a, as an image. And what I found remarkable about this is instead of Kovgal intervening, which is what you'd expect to save his monks, it's actually Columkilla. And Columkilla and his monks, um, they pray, and through the miraculous power of Columkilla, um, they're saved. And it, it's a very nice, it's a, it's a lovely metaphor. It's, it's a beautiful passage. Um, but it also is in line with how Kofkal and his community appear throughout the life of Columba, their community, which are seen maybe a little bit as rivals, but ultimately as being inferior to Iona and to Colin Gilla. And behind that anecdote is I think that whole history of the relations that Bangor has with churches in, in the west of Scotland. And ultimately Iona does become the most important church um, and far, um, far outweighs Bangor as, as the narrative develops. But I thought it would be, you know, really interesting to sort of say, well, are there connections you know, beyond the connections that we have with Iona, are there other ecclesiastical sites that we can point to? And I think we can see here a sort of an almost hidden history of these connections between Down and, and Western Scotland. So what I want to, to do now, and just look at my time, I've just got it about right, is I want to just pause for a moment and to, to think a little bit more about this idea of, of, of connection and, and connection across the Irish Sea. I mean, what, one of the, I suppose, things which is, is most difficult for how modern history is often written is modern history is often written as a form of national history. Um, and it's something that goes back to the origins of the modern discipline in the 19th century, where it was very much connected with telling the story of the rise and fall of empires and nation states. Uh, when we look at the history of the Irish Sea region, however, national histories don't actually get us very far, and we need to think of the Irish Sea as a region as a whole, and the connections that people had with each other across the Irish Sea. The Irish Sea isn't the boundary, the Irish Sea is what joins people, and by, and if you think about somebody who's living in, say, the Ards Peninsula, they're going to be looking south towards Louth, they'll be looking towards Tyrone, they'll be looking eastwards, uh, towards Western Britain. 
So to think that the histories of, of Ireland or of Northern Britain, you know, end in the Irish Sea is the wrong way of looking at those histories. And in this early medieval period, people weren't thinking about the national boundaries of the future. They were thinking of their connections with each other. And those connections, we can see them in those shared languages, as we can see it to this day, you know, shared beliefs, political rivalries and shared saints. And for me, that's probably the most important thing that I see when I look at the age of Columcilla and thinking about it 1500 years later is that it's a story about sharing. It's a story about connectivity um, and it's a story about how modern political boundaries aren't true to the past and maybe to a certain extent aren't necessarily true to the present either. So I'd like to thank you for listening and giving me the opportunity once again to, to speak about this topic. Gramila Michael Elva, Vishishan Harvest Special, Augusta Tatunye, Anna Hajawar Mak, the Horch doing an oct to much fear we achieved as an upper of her to his chest of Hanchen. At a fear spragu, Augusta Tanye, Jarku Nua, a horch doing er hewacht, Vahi, Naneu, Augus, a new assertion er Nanashkata, Edger, Ewain, Edger Alabin, Augus Aaron, a Homilishan, Edger, Nachira, her father, for the doing. Agus Tewart na Farage, Marvala Comerside, Agus Marvala Tashchel, Agus Marvala La Ruchtan of Ahogin Erginiara. So I just want to thank you, Alva, for such a very interesting and inspiring talk tonight. Um, you know, really creating the connections through, you know, even even you know, with the approach that you that you took with the saints' lives and the martyrologies and the place names, and of course. I mean, nowhere better than um, Belfast, and especially with the Place Names Project in Queens, uh, you know, who are really the world leaders on this area. So it's it's such a it's such a wonderful insight into really who we are and how we are connected to the greater world than ourselves, bringing it right back, as you said, to the seventh century and up to the current day. Now, before I introduce our panel. I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind, uh, Elva. We'll, we'll just, we could yeah. briefly touch on these before we move on to the panel, because I know uh, we, we have time, but maybe not as much time as we would like. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, the name of the monastery in County Down, the, uh, one of our, our correspondents here is, uh, has said about it being Movella, uh, as yeah. opposed to Movell. And yeah, want to comment on that. Yeah, no, actually, completely and one hundred percent right. Um, I only came a across this um, a few years back, and and what has happened is that in the written literature about it, it's referred to as Moville with the mm -hmm. e, and the actual name now is Movilla, mm -hmm. and it, it can be really confusing. But yeah, we, yeah. we should actually yeah. adopt the practice. Of yeah. saying Movilla completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then of course some of that goes down to the, you know, the pronunciation and the foriat in different in different areas yeah. of language as well. That can yeah, be some rooted. Some, yeah, there's yeah. some odd ones there. I mean, there's um yeah. I mean there's a couple of places and weirdly enough in Tipperary as well, where this happens, where there's a sort of almost um the the English version doesn't relate to I mean, at least Movilla and Movilla are quite close to each other. But yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. An, it is. It is an oddity. Yeah. 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 And uh, just a second question here. Now there are four in particular here that I'm going to that are uh, that we can address. Um, can you say a little bit about Saint Finian in Movilla and County Down in comparison to Saint Finian in Movilla, Cooley Cross and Church and County Donegal, and uh, what remains today maybe at the Movilla and the Down site, if you want to. Yeah, yeah there's, there's not there's not yeah there's not a huge amount that 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 remains in terms of the the actual sites themselves but a, a lot does remain in, in 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 the literature which i think is interesting is that in 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 terms of um I'm just trying to think of the best way of putting it so you know in the in the sixth century you've got these i suppose prominent churchmen who are from britain who are really influential on how the irish church develops and finian seems to be the most important of them um, but he he ends up having being localized in different parts of Ireland, but they seem to be mainly the same Finian. So okay. Finian in Donegal, Finian in Moville, and then there's a Finian in Clonard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
they all seem to be localizations of the same. What's what's interesting is the different Finians. I I went down a rabbit hole on Finians a while back. <laughs> it's I was saying I hope nobody asks me about the Finians. Um, it, it it's it's just so difficult to yeah, untangle yeah. them. But the the different Finians are are then given different genealogies. So we know the name Finian is, is British, but the Finian in um, Moville is given a local genealogy. Mm -hmm. Same with the one in Donegal, same with the one in Clonard. And then you have the added complication that because he's so revered by people, you do then get people named after him yeah. who are yeah. separate Finians. Um, and uh, you know, I, I have a colleague of mine, um, you know, he's probably actually one of the greatest experts on Irish saints. And I have this image of him throwing his hands up and saying, actually, they're all just the same Finian, which is what he does say. But yeah, I, I think those ones are the same. So he seems yeah. to have had, again, we're relying on later sources, but it seems likely that there's um, there's at least one document that he wrote that survives, mm -hmm. which is a sort of a handbook for penance. Yeah. And he apparently corresponded um, with Gildas, who's a churchman in Britain, who's also then known by Columbanus, who mentions him when he writes to the Pope. And I'm sure the Pope is going Gildas, who, you know, Columbanus clearly thinks yeah. he's very important. But no, he's, he's obviously a very inspirational figure for people. The fact that his memory lives on so long. Yeah, yeah. I guess the area and she towered the I guess came much. I guess an Iraq channel talking. You know, it really brings us back mm -hmm. to those roots of who we are and how you know how how important uh, those are. But also, I think something that's really coming out of your research, Elva, is the depth and the breadth of work that you have done in manuscript material. And you know that that is it's so uh, intricate as as um as um methodology of, of, of research and, um, you know, what, what you have done in the context of bringing all of that to the present day. And, you know, even in the context of names, it's funny, um, you know, I, I, you know, in the context of St. Donna and I'd often, you know, heard of the uh, and egg and, you know, th those areas, but I had never actually come across the name until, um, uh, about three weeks ago, I was giving a talk in Donegal and one of the people, and I was asking him, you know, about his name and had he had he known and you know often people aren't aware of the significance so it's it's so important uh that this you know bringing it down to not only you know the, the place names but also the personal names there's just two short questions again Elvin I'm conscious you've already given us a wonderful absolutely inspiring talk tonight and brought Colm Keller into the 21st century for us in a way that pr probably could not have done and in a very realistic way with you know with with, with a lovely um approach on on the three ways in which you looked at the island saints and uh, the sites and of course then finishing off with Iona but if they just um did these saints or monks write mo mostly in Latin or in Gaelic um, yeah, in, 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 a, in a combination. So yeah. in the, the sort of the very early sources, so say maybe seventh century, a lot of it is 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 in Latin, but they might have bits of Gaelic in it or they'll have phrases. Yeah, um, yeah. And then from maybe say about the ninth century, it's actually more in Gaelic than it would be in Latin. So it, 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 the, the relationship between the languages sort of changes. So yeah. you know, Latin definitely starts, starts off as more, I suppose, high status. And then it shifts around. But I would say most of those who wrote would have been bilingual okay, okay. in both of them. Uh -huh. And um, th there are two more questions, if you don't mind, Alva, that have just come in. So, And I, and I will end it at that. But uh, the, the, the fourth one, how would St. Ninian of Whitthorn uh, fit with this coastal world, in your opinion, if you have an opinion? Yeah, on that, or how it's, you it's, think a, it? it's, it's yeah. a great question, actually, because... Yeah. Ninian does get, I mean, obviously Withorn is, is a very important site. I mean, archaeologically, it's a very important site. The cult of Ninian looks like it's an exceptionally important early cult up in that, that part of, sort of I suppose, northern Britain. In terms of the connection, there may be, I'm saying this in a very speculative way, though, there may be a connection with Finian. Now, that connection is made in, in much later sources than I'm looking at. Mm. Um, you know, and there's no there's no getting away from the fact that there's also probably a lot of early Christianity in Pictland as well. Yeah. So there's a 
there's a tendency for it is it is odd for such an important site in later texts a whole bunch of Irish saints are connected with Ninian and they they, they go up to to Withorn to get educated it's either Ninian or it's David in Wales and yeah. but, but that's sort of more maybe 12th century and after, yeah. after. yes there's, yeah. there's definitely something going on what that something is 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 I'd say more just more difficult to to really be certain about and, and I suppose that's that's the interest and the problem of, of working in this area that there's there's quite large gaps where you would like to be able to say something more specific but you end up waffling slightly the way I have there yeah the, the detective work um just there's one more and then I'm going to give the, the final uh, question to uh, Brian Lacey, who we all know as uh, such an expert as well on Colin Kill. Um, were there any female saints in that period who were influential in Ireland and Scotland? That's the second last question. I killed myself looking for female saints. It was so frustrating because I I recently been working on um, was there something, something different, but it was sort of Kerry-based saints. And I found Garaka in um, Valencia and I was completely delighted. And if I could have found one for this evening, believe me, I turned, I turned over every rock that I could. I um, mean, you do, you do get the sort of the, the mothers of the saints type of thing, um, where a saint's mother becomes seen as a saint herself. That's not as, as satisfactory, obviously, as, as, as identifying, you know, a, a particular female saint. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand your frustration in that. Oh, no, I, I, I actually went back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. If, if there was one I could have used, I, I definitely would have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got, I got as close as there's an unnamed woman who appears in Jonas's life of Columbanus, who oh, is yeah. his inspiration to go to Kovkal and Bangor. But mm -hmm. it's so typical of those texts of that era that all of the important men are named. Yeah. But none of the women are, they're yeah. just a woman. Yeah, yeah. Writing writing practices and yeah. writing traditions. Yeah. And finally, from Brian Lacey, and I'm, I'm mentioning Brian as um uh, as as uh, as an expert on uh uh Column Kill and uh who has contributed so much in this area. So having looked at the wider picture, do you think Elva? Uh, the, dispropor the, the disproportionate dominance of Iona was historically true, or only the product of propaganda, mainly by Othamnum, uh, and the accident of survival of documentation? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a difficult question. I, I would say that it, it is definitely partly historically true. I mean, in terms of, yes, Adavnon and Adavnon is a propagandist. That's also true. I mean, by the time, you know, Adavnon is writing and, and, and you look at the breadth of Iona's connections, you know, as was particularly their involvement in the conversion of Northumbria, there are really extensive connections with pretty major churches um, in Ireland as well. So I, I think it, it's a case that it's not so initially. So I think what's happened is when, if you go back to maybe the late sixth into the early seventh century, you know, maybe Iona is very important then, but it's not maybe as prominent as it becomes later. And I think what's happening to a certain extent is maybe that Adavnon is taking the, um, I suppose, the situation in his own day, and then he's writing it backwards into the past of Iona. So I think the, the propaganda is not so much the current situation that Iona is, uh, which Adavnon is describing. I think it's maybe what he's describing in the past. So I think I those know. sort of, those connections with Kovkul, for example. Um, and, and if you think about maybe the way Bangor has these, has these interests, yeah. you, you do end up reading them in a different light. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Alva, we will take you out of the hot seat now. And uh, thank you once again. Tatuini, Anachod Olish, Agus Anachod Smoincha, a hort doing an ocht er er Holomkilla, Agus Alan Machnu, Lejanu, a Mahan Shahar and Flay. So you're just after helping us now to feed into the new um, the the panel discussion now. And I know you'll be staying with us, Elva. And thank you again for such a wonderful wonderful talk and uh, for all the work that you put into um, 
making this such an interesting uh, event for us. So I'm going to move on now to uh, our panel. And as I said, Elva will be staying with us. Um, and we are very fortunate to have an excellent panel here tonight. I'm going to introduce everybody. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. I do have a little bit of detail here, but I'll do my best to try and keep it brief because I do want to start uh, a very interesting discussion in the context of Elva's talk, but also bringing this, and this is really where, where we're coming into, where we are at the moment, what is the role of um, the, you know, the shared saint um, aspect of early Middle Ages in, in our lives today. And, you know, can, can we look at, you know, um, can, can we look at this in a contemporary context as well as what we've had? So, are those Tosoi me le Shnadini a Taos Mahor, Agus Eid Ahar and Ahnajiv Tosoi me le Linda Irvin, Agus Boilam Falch Ahar Riv Argain Chori an Ocht Fasta. So, the country of Togin Maradurch Mehana, Linda Irvine, Leanne Briggs, Meg Bateman, and Ingus McKinnoch. So, Toigu Linda Irvine and Erher Valfarsche, Marwal Coney or Higa Foyle, Agus and Yablinta, Hayuik Chaisk Berla, Hossishik Folum, the Gedica Arangani, a mission at Valfarsche, her, then Aglish Woch. Wani Linda Chuns Turris Chunskatal Gaelic, Fuiska and Vision, a Tanish, a Chaisk Gaelic, then a Kate, then your faster. Credjev Lager Christi, Eglinda Ehein, Agus Duskal Shid Niskol, Nashalti, Niskol Omlanahit, Shrivan, the Gaelic Tus Yarafor, Fehehehehein. Virim Shachunska, the Lakuik Taringarger, Irak, the Gaelic of Valfarsh, Agazar, Alu, Agazal Tamil, the Vlienta, the Kajwar Janta Eki, Agazak Taras, Laharger, the Gaelic Mask, Frotastuni, Agaz Entachti, Agaz Jil Shuri, Huiga Alu. I guess being Karu or Higamanic, the Lorch and the man, the Shea and the Kahir Lachfasta, a common Lutlas Gael or her Valfarsche. Now, I'm not going to translate all of it, but I will, I do want to say just to give you um, a flavour of, of Linda's wonderful achievements and how delighted we are to have her with us tonight. She was born in East Belfast, where she still lives. After years of teaching English, she started teaching Irish in the East Mission. Um, uh, centre of the Methodist Church, and she founded Taurus, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, the Irish language project under the auspices of the mission, and which is now responsible for teaching Irish to hundreds of adults. She has done amazing work on um, bringing the attention of the Irish heritage to um, Protestants, uh, Unionists and uh, Ulster Loyalists in a way that uh, has made it a very real part of a shared culture and a shared heritage. So, Falsha Roth, Linda, Agus Anish, Leanne Briggs, Leanne is Kunter Museum, Mac Museum, and doing Hui Leanne. But I will prove role like a Dakila Hyrat Christie, one of Stervanaher, Agus Neve Columbans, our Staral Kurher, Falsha Kita App, and a Belluga Agus Korhiat. Uh, Leanne is the museum assistant at North Down Museum, where she has taken uh, on the main role of the Christian heritage and history of St. Columbanus, uh, including producing historical content for the various apps leaflet signage and conducting tours, as well as working with friends of Columbanus and Bangor Abbey. So, Falcha wrote, uh, Leanne. Okay. I guess uh, Anish and Tolov Meg Bateman are the Philly Estherity, uh, Agas Liachtor Exawil Mor Ostig. And uh, for those of you um, who, who aren't familiar with uh, Meg, uh, Professor Meg Bateman, uh, Meg is um, one of the most important poets in uh, Gaelic Nahalaban and a lecturer in Sawil Mor Ostig on the Isle of Skye, uh, again, where Loch and Ellen Cholum Killa uh, are found on the north side. So, Falcha wrote um, Meg, Neil Sugamul, me able to Anlinia, a Ekel and Shaw, so Shilam Gorhordu, yeah. Yeah, so Falsha wrote Meg Chiam an issue. Agus, uh, and then you Jaranach an issue, uh, and then you go to Tarot Lagach, then you Ella, na, uh, Dr. Ingus McKinnach, Agus or Noy, uh, Le Lingus, as Nish, uh, in Ellen Yosh, the Ingus, Agus Marwal Aglish, uh, O Wal Savanish, at the Ensha, Agus, uh, Agrian. Um, Agrian uh, Ingus Srei Lierti Sagalic, the Homan Gallic Lasku, Agas Viclar Lierti, and Nelik Ogazanalic, Rundaralaji, Darala de Vierafor, de Vierafor, the Holm Killer, Mila Kuig Heed. So, um, Ingus is from Ellen Loish, uh, and uh, there is, of course, um, a church from the late Middle Ages there also. And he is responsible for a series of lectures uh, on the um, 
Gaelic Society of Glasgow and uh, has already had a series of lectures, a program of lectures in Gaelic and in Gaelic uh, on the 2nd of October uh, on Colum Killa. So without further ado, I'm going to um, start the discussion maybe and um, uh, with congratulating uh, Elva on her wonderful talk. And yes, we've looked at the saints in, um, you know, in the context of, you know, saints' lives, martyrologies and place names. And maybe in the context of how relevant that is today in the context of our shared histories and shared journeys. Meg, I might start with you if that's if, if, if you don't mind coming in um, at the beginning just to see how we can and I mean if, if, if panelists would like to put up their hand or if there's anybody who wants to come in on the chat, uh, you can put something into the question and answers and I will get to it as we're going along if anybody would like to ask a question to our our esteemed panelists, I might say, I'm delighted uh, to be in the company of so many who have uh, done work on Column Killer and are familiar with these shared uh, histories that we now have. So, Meg, I, I might start with you. Well, yes, Alpha, that was a glorious talk and many, many thanks. What I was listening to, I was asking myself about the shared claims that might be made between saints that were going to Dalriata on the other side of Strunamula, but wasn't really unknown land to them. The date we have for the Gales coming over to Scotland has always been put back, certainly by 300. And I wonder if the main division is really between the Gales and the Picts. There's, so Columbus was, he was going as much as a, an ambassador for the, to sort out the tension between the Gales and the Picts as he was doing quite martyrdom and being, doing peregrinatio pro Christo. And I think we see, as, as the saints go, keep on going further and further north. Um, and we have Maluag, who came from Ireland, but ends up in Lewis and um, Chico writing in the ninth century that lots of, lots of monks were going to um, Iceland and maybe beyond, certainly Faroe and Shetland, that there's a tension between the political moves across the sea, uh, to, across as um, Strunamula, that probably wasn't a significant barrier at all because it was the high road, but also the, the competing claims of the Picts and the Gales for the west coast of Scotland, and then their spiritual claims of wanting to find a place of resignation, in the, of uh, resurrection, sorry, in the ocean. Yeah, and, and I think in, um, and I'm going to bring this right on to uh, the context of today, and I'm going to go to Linda next, uh, maybe in the context of, you know, where do you see, Linda, in the context of the work that you have been doing uh, in, in recent times in particular, and, and I, I could call it a lifetime's work really in what you have done. Where, where do you see in the context of what Meg has said in, you know, that high road, you know, trying to find, as I would say, an, an Irish charman, uh, you know, kind of that there's a, um, a protection or perhaps, you know, some uh, solace to be found in those journeys that maybe, you know, Columbanus being the ambassador, you know, to try and bring the, uh, to, to try and bring communities together. Uh, is there something in that for us to understand in the context? You know, how, how do we make that relevant for today, in the communities we live? I, I think there definitely is. I, I think one of the things that interested me listening to um, Elva's um, lecture there, which was fabulous and just full of so much amazing information. Um, you know, over the years, I have, I've become more and more aware of the shared language. And I, I think you know, I come from a place that many people um, within Northern Ireland, not just from within the unionist community, but probably mainly within the unionist community, just have total um, a total lack of awareness of the shared language and of the of the. You know, we we have this idea that we look to Scotland and we have these Scottish connections, yet we know nothing at all about you know a sort of an ancient place and the true history of the country, and that fascinates me. Um, Obviously, with Colin Kill, there's an awareness of the of the shared saint um, there, 
but of the other saints, no. So for me, you know, these things are very important because they talk to us of, a, of I suppose, a, um, a history before, um, the, the, the kind of, the, the little battles that, that we have now um, in, the, in the kind of British Irish, you know, the, the division and, um, you know, with, with this tells us there's so much shared history between these islands. And I think that's the thing that, um, you know, as somebody involved in the work I do interests me because people tell me that the language is divisive. I think, no, you know, it's, it's the opposite. It was a linguistic link between these islands, not just in the sense of the Gaelic, but, you know, as part of a, of a, of Celt a Celtic language and, you know, that Celtic history. I'm really keen that people know more about that when I don't think we get the opportunity, really. So, yeah, I, I think this is, um, I, I suppose, another aspect of it with the saints really fascinate me and can bring people more together and increase understanding of who we really are. Yeah, very, very relevant, Linda. And I think in the context even of, you know, where, where Elva, where you mentioned, you know, and telling the story, I mean, really a lot of the manuscripts, even, you know, when we look at the flight of the airs, that it's telling the story, it's telling what they have done, what they experienced on the way. And even, you know, where, where you explained about Cofcol and Columbanus meeting, you know, on the road between Lemavadi and Derry. I mean, many of us can identify with that meeting, you know, without having to go, um, you know, without having to think of it in a very, you know, academic or learned sense, but in the context of people meeting, and that maybe a lot of this is what, what that's about. Uh, Angus, I just want to want to come to you in the, in the context of where, uh, and particularly in the context of where you are located as well, uh, on a very different uh, aspect of this. Uh, how do you see the role of Colum Kill in the context of what Alva was speaking about today uh, and, the, and the saints' lives? And uh, maybe if you can bring us just into where you are and br bring that uh, over to Belfast, maybe to us uh, in the context of this evening's symposium. Yeah, well, I must admit I'm a bit of an imposter here, really. I'm, I'm not really a med medievalist at all. And um, I... I um... I come to this really as someone who's more interested in the, in the sort of 16th, 17th century, and <clears throat> I'm really interested. I come originally from an island in um, Northern Hebrides. We have um, uh, Chambal Volui, uh, St. Molua's Church. We've got uh, Elan Cholum Kilia, and, and we know nothing about it, uh, really. And um, and one of the, the things we did uh, recently was um, come Gaelic Law School was to try and a building awareness uh, of that, and we had some great contributors. Some of them uh, have already spoken uh, when the questions. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, some of my colleagues too could probably better uh, speak in Glasgow. Could uh, speak. Uh, some of my distinguished colleagues could speak um, um, more usefully to this brief. Really, um, I've got colleagues who are working on uh, Iona Namescapes project at the moment. A uh, project led by uh, Professor Thomas Clancy and Professor uh, Catherine Forsyth. So they could speak uh, a, a lot more on, on, on that. In terms of my teaching and uh, research, uh, I, I, the earliest I really go is the, the 12th century and the Book of Deer. And I've always very struck with the, the Gaelic notes in the Book of Deer and the, the, the northeastern extremity of Scotland. When uh, these monks, Gaelic monks, were getting uh, their property rights called into question um, and they, they collated all the information they had and they started out their, their claim to, to justify their um, property rights in the northeast of Scotland in the 1120s, 1130s uh, by, um, by tying themselves to, to Columba. Columba came from Iona and hooked up with Droston, the, the local saint. So they're, they're, they're trying to, um, uh, to use uh, Columba for that reason. And Columba retained his cachet um, uh, despite the, 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 the drift away from Gaelic in the south and, and east of um, Scotland. So uh, allegedly, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but allegedly at, at, at Battle of Bannockburn, for example, um, the, the break Bianoch uh, with, with Columbus relics were, were led in front of the Scottish army and so on. And what's uh, my own research and um, interest really is in the, the sort of Reformation and, and post-Reformation period. And what's really interesting, I think, too, is that when you see uh, the, the, the post-Reformation bishops uh, 
located in Iona. They, um, the, the documents are all in Scots, uh, but they, 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 um, the, the place name isn't Iona, it's E. Column Kill. That's how it's written yeah. in Scots. So even after a, you know, a, 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 a religion which is, is pretty allergic to saints, uh, Columba makes the transition pretty well, which is really interesting and something I'd like to explore further, maybe. <laughs> It just seems to be so there are so many tangents and so many so many angles on this and Leanne I'm going to come to you now uh, coming to the County of Saints uh, which is where uh, you are located and uh, maybe you could give us you know just tell us maybe a little bit about your work and how you know and I mean in a very real sense making this connection I mean we've been talking about connections all evening and we've come right from the connection of the sea the highways right over now to perhaps to the technological connections that you deal with in so many ways, as well as other ways, of course, within your work with the apps and uh, signage and that. So maybe would you, would you like to maybe do, um, tell us just a little bit about the work with the Friends of Columbanus and uh, Bangor Abbey. Yeah, I mean, we were always aware of how many wonderful scenes we have and it's great to hear them mentioned because um, we like to sing about it a lot, but not everyone realizes it's great to hear Alva talking about that. Um, and um, it was a great thing that the council had always realised it was a tourism potential and that as well as an education side of things. It was always part of bringing school kids in to teach them about it and hope that they embrace that and take that forward in the future. Um, but equally, a lot of schools didn't teach that back in the day. So that was what we felt was really important, you know, adult education as much as children. And that's where things like the app came in. And also in a world today, technology is so important for doing that. Um, people want to discover things and technology is that way to embrace that side of things. So um, the Friends of Colin Bannas was only more recently set up to try and bring that attention to that great saint um, because he was one of the first Europeans that's been noted as that. Um, he brought Christianity across Europe, he created those churches, the saints that he then educated and he created throughout that that went across the world it was incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been great. We've seen so many pilgrims come into us in the museum, um, mm -hmm. wanting to learn more about Bangor Abbey, about the other saints. Um, and we're lucky because there's such a great network of those. And it is completely interdenominational for us. It's, it's not a religious divide, which it can be, and saints can be seen as that sort of divisive thing to some people. Um, the Friends of Colin Banas have people from the Church of Ireland, from the Presbyterian churches, from the Catholic faith. Um, from the Methodist. So it's it's a lovely unifying force and we have interdenominational services, lectures, walks, um, and we continue to grow that with public art that's around the borough as well, with signage, um, and yeah, we've grown those roots now as well with the pilgrim walk sort of as it's being developed around the borough as well, which will link from Ireland through Cumber, uh, Bangor, uh, and hopefully through into Europe as well, playing over with our connections in, in France and Austria and Italy. Okay, wow, wonderful. <laughs> There's plenty of scope. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, just there are, um, Alva, there's a question here, but I, I just, I'm, I'm very conscious of time now. And um, there is a question here that I'm just going to maybe uh, wrap up with because I know we're supposed to finish at half past eight. We've approximately four minutes. Um, how do we build our links in a practical way between the two sides of the Sea of Moyle? This can be in terms of culture, tourism, even enterprises in the glens. We have formed networks with colleagues in Dalriada and would welcome support and any initiatives. And happy to be Lord of the Isles if it helps, we are told, but just on that question, you know, maybe we might just go around to everyone on the panel, you know, is there a way we can think of building our links in a practical way, you know, between the two sides of the moil, as we said. And I think this is very important because we, we people, again, who are working, you know, in middle age research on uh, manuscript work on the saints and we've got right up to the present day on language projects so I mean I think the diversity of our opinion here would be very important so Meg I might start with you on a way that you might think and probably in the context of your own scholarship as well Meg and I, I know um, you, your, your work I'm very familiar with it and you know and you know what in the context of because I I, I believe that it is in the roots of those of that scholarship that we can bring a real understanding to present day on to present day communities and connectivity um because it is in that that we are and it needn't necessarily be shared histories it's just in the knowledge of of 
of who we are. So, and, and I think sometimes we have to delve deep. Meg, I'll let you um, come in on that. Um, and I'll just, I'll just go around the panel briefly just to finish off on that. Well, thank, thank you to your um, long question. You gave me an idea because when you first said it, I thought, goodness me, <laughs> what will I say? Um, I think Leanne's idea of, of um, tourism is very good because all these Western retreats are in such beautiful places. But in the context of the Glasgow COP summit just now, and Magbilla being named for a sacred tree and the sense that nature was felt to be holy and that this world wasn't a veil of tears to the early Gallic Christians, I think that both um, uh, traditions can come together on the green question, the, the green hypothesis in the early Gallic church. Excellent. That's that's really wonderful, Meg. That's, I mean, these, <laughs> this, no, but this is why it is so wonderful to come together like this, um, because we do understand literally in the context of the tree, the roots, but also the context of the historical and the manuscript roots. Elva, I might just let you come in because I'm conscious that although you've given a talk and you answered, um, because I'm just going to finish up with giving everybody, you know, um, I just would like to get everybody's uh, final opinion on this. So Elva, would you like to contribute to that maybe? And just first of all, to say to Meg, I love your idea about taking the billa from the, the place name and, you know, connecting it in. I mean, that's just genius. It's fantastic. Um, I mean, I suppose from where I'm where I'm suppose I'm coming from, I would say one way would be and this is going to sound like a probably a very academic point, but um, it's something I sort of refer to a little bit is there's sort of maybe an assumption um, on this side of the IRC that if you talk about Gaelic, it's always about Ireland. And I think it's thinking about the equality of that relationship, that it's not just about Ireland, it's also about Scotland as well, and sort of drawing in on that connection and that there is that shared history and thinking maybe not so much about just the island of Ireland, but sort of thinking of that whole Irish Sea area and, and the connections between the island. I think that would be something that would be really positive to bring, um, definitely it's something that could be very positively brought to some of the scholarship anyway. But I think beyond that, I think it would also be sort of maybe an important way to, to reimagine where we are and where our histories are. Hey, thank you, Helva. Very, I mean, we're, that's uh, and, and tying in, as we said, from the roots of the language right into the shared language. Or maybe, Linda, I'm going to go to you next because some of what Elva has said probably ties into, um, I think, your work, you know, in the context of shared language. Would you like to come in on that in the context yes, of how we build the links? Very much. Uh, and obviously, because I am working within um, language, that, that would be what I'm interested in. It is the shared links. So for me, um, and I, I think it would be a wonderful way of um, increasing um, I think just tourism and people's interest is the knowledge of the fact that the language went over to Scotland. I think the focus in on place names and even the fact of our own surnames, which are Gaelic and Gaelic. And uh, also one of the things I really fascinated me when I discovered when we look at the Scots language, of course, it's Gaelic. And why wouldn't it be? And then Ulster Scott, of course, you know, and the, and the overlap between the languages, I suppose. So instead of saying, you know, terribly polarised entities that belong to one community or the other, showing how we draw on both. And I, I think that's a lovely way of bringing people together and also increasing maybe the, the traffic, the footfall between Ireland and Scotland. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we're coming up with great ideas here. And uh, I think a lot of this has stemmed... Um, um, Meg, I think you 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 started off with something uh, a, a really wonderful, you know, bringing us back to the place names, bringing us back to actually, uh, as you said, connecting even today on what's going on in Glasgow with the Magbilla. So there's 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 something coming here from all of this, maybe. Um, Angus, I'll just go to you next, if that's um, okay. If you have something to contribute on that, maybe. Well, just uh, the only thing I can really think of contributing is. Um, what we thought of doing was was having a bilingual um, sort of symposium and and um, with Gaelic and Gaelic with without any English. We're always translating, but uh, and, and, and okay, there wasn't much translating, uh, and but it 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 could work perhaps if there's um, with um, 
subtitling into from Gaelic into Gaelic and the other way. And that could work very well over Zoom um, and, and with a bit more thought and, and resource. That could that could be a way of engaging both speech communities without having to resort to English. Yeah. Or yeah. Mutual intelligibility. Yeah. And of course, I mean, that, that that's one of the keys to this. And, and you have, you know, had your series of talks uh, on Colin Kill in both languages, which is really a starting point, and I suppose probably also outlines, and if I, uh, if I can say it, but the work of Forrest the Gillig in the context of the dictionary works and that, and, you know, the context of having an Irish-Irish uh, dictionary and that we have those, you know, that we're, we're dealing with, you know, lexicelt and, you know, the, the, the transfer from a Celtic language to another Celtic language was something actually in the context of um, uh, linguistic uh, domination, if you like. We had some Chinese students uh, in uh, the college recently and uh, they're, 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 one of their focuses was to uh, have the translation from one Celtic language to another, as opposed to going from English. And, and they wanted then, of course, Chinese to Irish. And it, it really opened up a whole new way of looking at language because we were thinking, you know, we automatically think, you know, but that's, a, that's not bi-directional, that's actually tri-directional, if you like, because you're trying to go through the English path. But do we need to go through, you know, to, to we have so many languages that we can avail of and to, to to use that way. So I think that approach is very, very admirable, Ingus, and uh, and and challenging, challenging. Uh, so Leanne, maybe I'll give you the the the, the last word on this uh, on um, and you know maybe as the person who who is dealing with uh, with some of this in a real sense at the moment as well. Yeah, well, I mean that's what we we try to engage with as many people as we can and do that sort of cross-community, cross-directional, cross-country, it's been amazing. Um, so it has been a combination of all those things. It's having these talks online that people can access from wherever they are in Europe, uh, uh, that's the skill we're working on at times. Um, it's the things that they can download, the PDFs, they can download up programs that bring them together, that they can work from the same resources and then come up with their own ideas. Um, art, because you don't need to speak any language with art. It's a visual context, so that works on a universal scale. Um, so it's all those things. I think a combination of them is the best way to, to embrace everybody together. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and on that note, I think then, uh, I think Andrew has, uh, thank you, Andrew, for your talk, for your question. You made my, my uh, role uh, very easy tonight because it was uh, exactly the kind of question that I would have liked to have asked. And uh, it's great when it comes from um, our, our participants. So thank you. And I think you've given us all food for thought tonight and some, uh, some thoughts to go away with, uh, not only in the context of the saints and their role in, um, you know, in that strong link between uh, East Ulster and uh, Western Scotland, but also in the context of even, you know, it's something when I was listening to Alva tonight, you know, just it has some, you know, Schley column killer. And, and I think actually somebody mentioned that in, in the chat. Maybe I, I think I saw somebody saying something about it, you know, that there were, um, you know, that, that there are so many um, ways in which we can actually journey today in, in a real way through certainly our manuscript material, through our literature, through our sources. And as you said, Elva, which are so important that we know the sources that we're using, uh, but also in a real way. And maybe COVID has given us a lot of you know, time to think about uh, how we do need to uh, get back out and do our, our and engage with uh, the, you know, the journey. And um, as we say, even Magvilla, and to see how these all relate in a real way to the environment in which we are living in a cultural sense, in a geographical sense, you know, and also in within the linguistic boundaries uh, that we that we all that we all share and uh, also in the way that we can build on those. And that's what commemorations like this are about, that we hope that we can learn and we can bring some of it uh, with us as we develop new projects and as we also build on the projects that we had. So I'm going to um, finish on that now tonight we're a little bit over time and I'm, I'm sorry about that but I thought it was worth going around to everybody and uh, I'm just sorry that we haven't more time uh, to discuss this um, I, I think there's plenty more that we could be uh, delving into tonight and I want to thank all our panelists our our keynote speaker Dr Elva Johnson uh, Linda Irvine Leanne Briggs Meg Bateman and Angus McKinnock Gordon Milam Wahigov as Ahanrod 
a hugs of doing an oct as as our magnav a horse doing agus magicolare a swinchu air holam kela mila quick head on the thoughts that you have given us and on the possibilities uh, you have presented to us tonight in the context of scholarship, shared history, shared language, and shared journeys, and uh, that hopefully we'll have many more of them. And uh, I know Linda, uh, that's Taurus, uh, will certainly be, be central in that. Thank you very much. Good night.